Hi, this is Nisha, and this is episode four in story time, where I just talk about my personal guns. And I thought I'd talk about my guns in 9 by 18 macro because the caliber and the gun holds a real special place for me. I bought one very early on in my gun collecting. And really, all my guns here, none of them cost a whole lot. And it's always nice to enjoy a gun when you don't put a lot of money into it. So, and each one has a little story behind it. Now, normally, I just bring out two or three guns in this series, but why not? We were out shooting a few of these. So we have some shooting footage we'll toss up, toss up so you're not bored. But, um, yeah, we'll talk about these and just kind of go from there. Here we have the Russian IJ-70AH. This is our, already in its own little video. Next, we have a Russian military gun, which is in several videos, too. Then we have a Bulgarian, which is one of the current imports you can get from SOG and others. And we have an East German. And all of these are truly Makarovs on this top row. 9 by 18 chambered, designed in Russia or copied from Russian designs. On the second row, we have a Hungarian SMC 918. And this is the semi-automatic civilian legal version of the R61. It has its own video too. This is the PA-63, the big brother, which was military service in Hungary. Now we have the Polish P-64, which is in a recent video we did about Polish service guns. Likewise, we have the Polish P-83, sometimes called the WANAD for Eagle. And finally, we have the Czech VZ-82, which has been very popular in the last decade for being affordable and a really good gun out of Czechoslovakia. While all of these are chambered for 9x18, none of them are what you could really consider a true Makarov. So, just little stories on these. The Bulgarian. This is not my original gun, unfortunately. My original wasn't quite as nice condition. <laughs> I picked this up recently to replace it. But... Around 2000, I really wanted a Walther PPK. Forgive me, I was young. And I had been seeing them in stores for, for a long time as a kid and teenager. But I just could not afford a Walther. And back around the late 90s, early 2000s, PPKs were getting valuable, especially true original Germans in 32. I never had been a 380 fan, and the Macro really clinched it. Well, a visiting friend said, well, if you can't get a PPK, he said, get a Makarov. Okay. So he went to a store. They were available. You could get the Bulgarians with holster, a couple of mags, for about $89 with all the goodies. The only negative back then, they had the thumb rest grip, which was added to comply with the 1968 sporting points system thing. That was also one of the very first guns I learned to clean Cosmoline out of, because they were soaked. <laughs> and it really was. It was a good early handgun to own. Very large, robust parts. Very forgiving. Just a, a great gun. Single action. Double action. We have a safety here. It even acts as a decocker. as on the Walther. That's nice. A manual slide release, which the Walther didn't even have. And of course, while this isn't as well made as a Walther, machining-wise, bluing-wise, it's a little bit, well, it's a lot bit more durable and uh, very, very reliable. And once I ended up buying a Bulgarian and then, of course, keeping 9 by 18 Makarov around, I never really had any interest in 380 because this does everything 380 does. It's a little more powerful and it's a lot more reliable because these guns were originally chambered for it. 
I had that one for a long time, but it's one to do. I was in grad school years later, and I sold it because the Bulgarian guns dried up. They noticed that so-called sneak guns were coming in from Bulgaria, which were actually Russian, and they were not supposed to be importing Russian guns like this one. This is a sneak. And so importation stopped for a while, and prices went up. So I was able to sell my gun for about 250 300 maybe with some ammo. And I did, because 300 bucks would uh, would pay the rent for the most part, and, you know, how it goes. No regrets, and I knew I could always pick another one up. Ironically, I paid about 300 for this one here, so all in all, it was fine. This sneak gun doesn't have a big story with me. I always just wanted a Russian military Makarov, and I bought this one off a, at the time, pretty well-known vendor on Gunbroker, and I, I paid for it. I really did. It was over 500 but... With Bulgarians going in about the 250 range at the time, yeah, I think it was worth it. I'm happy with it. I wanted an original. Like I said, not a lot of story. But it gives me the original. It makes a lot of appearance in our videos. This gun here, I shared its story in its own little video. It's the same as this, except it's a commercial gun with the commercial rear sights. And we have a double stack mag. And I actually did get a couple of original 12 rounders with this. This was before the 10 rounders were everywhere. Even the 10s are pretty pricey today and the 12s are out of sight. But this is an IMS, made at Ishesk, now Ishmash, commercial gun. They sold these high capacity versions in the uh, mid 90s for a couple of years before the bilateral agreement with Russia took effect. And I had seen the original military PMM online, like on Max's Modern Firearms Russia website. And then I heard that they did import some, and I had to go find one. It was really just luck of the draw. I walked into my local LGS not long after deciding I wanted one, and they had this laying there. And the price was, I thought, very fair. It was about 150 so it was more than the Bulgarians. This was around the same time, a little bit after. But I thought with a couple of mags, and I really wanted it, I'd grab it. But back then, being a college student, I actually put it on layaway and paid it off over three months. <laughs> we do what we have to do. I'm really glad. This is my original. I've had it for mm, 16 years. Uh, long time. It's a really nice gun. I enjoy shooting it. It did come with the more sporter grips originally, and then I was really lucky and found some military grips with the lanyard loop. So, it's the only change I made. I think I bought an extra mag. I think I have three for it now, but... The final one of the actual Makarovs belonged to my friend who retired about two years ago from the gun business. He'd been in it about 30 years. This was his East German. And um, he just walked up and asked me one day. He knew I liked Makarovs because I'd bought um, uh, this one from him and my original uh, Bulgarian too. So he asked if I wanted an East German. Said it wasn't mint condition, and that was fine with me because I these are such nice guns, nice triggers. God, this is it's, this is like Walther grade trigger, no joke. Even better. I wouldn't want a brand new mint East German. I would want one in 90 some odd percent I could shoot. So I took him up on it. These were always expensive, the East Germans. I remember seeing them in SOG about 2003, 2004, and they were wanting 299 for them back then. I believe I gave him 350 or 4 for this, and it came with a holster and stuff. Seems like in recent years the East German ones have really shot up. But I still have probably more in this one than any of the other Makarovs here except for my Russian sneak. But then again, the Russian's a very recent pickup comparatively. I've had it maybe five years, and all these others I've had much longer. I've had this one eight, ten years, a while. Nice gun, though. It's made the same as the other Makarovs. It just doesn't have the star on the grips. 
but these are exceedingly well made. If everyone thinks that communist stuff was, um, you know, utilitarian and functional, a lot of it was, but the East German stuff was really nicely done. This one doesn't have a lot of a story, and again, it has its own little video. The original was the RK-59. This was turned into the R-61, which was primarily made for police. It's a compact gun based on the PPK. It has a lightweight alloy frame. Originally, this was uh, pretty much aluminum. Later, they would add a little bit of titanium for strength. It's PPK size. We're still by 9 by 18 with a 6-round mag, single stack. Has a lot of the same features as a Makarov. Double, single action, decocker. Here, guys. Simple blowback, of course. But we have a Browning style mag release instead of the heel. And while we have a last round hold back, we don't have any kind of release. We have to drop the mag. So that's actually very much taken from the uh, Walther PP. I just picked one of these up years ago because I thought it was cool. They weren't a lot of money. And uh, these are pretty popular carry guns back in the 90s. Powerful little critter, 9x18. Extremely lightweight, quite compact. Snappy as a bitch, though. <laughs> <laughs> These are really snappy little guns. That's the trade-off you get, especially because it's just a straight blowback. At least a lot of the modern carry guns have um, have an operating system, have a locked breech, and that actually soaks up some of the recoil. This is a snappy little guy because it just all comes right back, and it goes right through the lightweight frame right into your hand. Fun, though. It's snappy but fun. And I've had this a few years. Probably about five as well. Again, they weren't a lot of money. Likewise, for the uh, PA-63, this is the Big Brother. It's identical, except it has a longer 7-shot mag, a longer grip. We have a longer barrel. This actually has one of the longest barrels on a standard military service 9 by 18 chambered gun. It has an alloy frame. This one's in the polished white. This one was anodized, but it would be white too. It's not blued, obviously, because it's alloy. You can find these without the thumb rest grip. This actually wasn't added for import. This was a later feature they added to the military guns for comfort, for right-handeders. For lefties, not so much. You see us shooting it. This is one we took out. It's pretty snappy too. And there's not a lot of a beaver tail to protect you. So if your hand is really riding up, you will probably get bit. I didn't, but it's only because I've had this thing like 15 years. These were really inexpensive. I'm not going to say they're bad. But these are well-made guns. But of the Makarovs back when they were all coming in, these probably had the lowest reputation. QC was known to be a little eh. Reliability, maybe not 100% like the others. And so I picked this up for a hundred bucks with a couple of mags from Century. I guess that was 10, 12 years ago for this actual one. I had one before it that a friend talked me out of. So this is my second PA-63. But I think it's a neat gun. It feels good. It's light. But the QC, at least the rumors of the day were, was kind of... Hmm. I, on my original one, I did have the spring on the slide holdback brake, so it's one of the few Makarov chambered guns that I have had a part fail on. But still neat, although probably about my least favorite to shoot. Well, I say that. There's this guy. This was a later one to come in. We saw the Russian commercial imports in the 90s. Then we saw the Hungarian and Russian sneaks in the late 90s, early 2000s. We saw the Hungarians, but the Polish came in pretty late. This is the P64, again featured in our Polish handguns video for its history. 
and these started to come around about 2000 where was I living at the time I usually can remember when things came in based on where I was living 2003 2004 was the first I started to see these come in and they were a little pricier because Poland has always had a good reputation for quality even during the communist era and these were following the um, the Polish Mosin Nagants, the M44 carbines, which always fetched more money than the uh, than the other ones like Hungarian, Romanian, or even Russian, just because of really pretty blooming, nice machining. So when the P64 started to show up, they were bringing about 150 to 175 back then at a time when when um, Hungarians were 100, Bulgarians were around 100, Russians maybe a smidge more for the commercial. So they were a little pricier. And they're a lot smaller. Mechanically, this is a very different gun. It uses a very different trigger system. Still double single action decocker. We've got a last round hold open, as you saw, but no release. We have the heel release. Six round little mag, like the R61. But this is an all steel gun. The trigger system is very different. If you notice, the trigger stays the same whether we're cocked or not. It's a very nice trigger in single action. It's horrible in double. I'm not trigger sensitive and to me this is heavy. The reason they did it, they needed a spring in it strong enough to ignite the primers. They wanted to use the same cartridges in this and their PDW, their small sub gun called the PM63. So that was their solution to put a very heavy spring in this to ignite them. The early ones, like this one, had the rounded hammer. Later they would go to a slightly longer shelf hammer for better grasping. This was kind of always meant to be more of a concealed carry gun, a police gun, an officer's gun. It was never standard like these in the PA-63. It was more like the R-61. So, this is pretty dang snappy too. You'd think with the steel frame it wouldn't be quite as much as the R61, but debating which of these is more snappy and less pleasant, I say this one's a little better to shoot. Jay believes this one is, so it's different hands and stuff, but it's still pretty snappy. I would not want to put more than a couple of mags through it without letting my hand rest. That said, it feels good, and it's well made, and I was really excited when these started to come in. This is my second or third one. I've had a few over the years and sold them and got them back. Really, the prices have not changed a lot on these. You can still pick these up for 200 to 300 today and get holsters and mags for them. Now, seeing that and liking Polish quality, but not liking the ergos of that gun, I really wanted this gun to come in, the PA-83. Now, this is a very late import, guys because they kept these in service up until very recently. These only started to hit American shores and be sold off around 2009. But I'm glad I waited and I picked one up. This is my second. Jay actually has my first one. And I've just got another one for myself. We still have good Polish quality, although they tried to make these a little cheaper, so they use more stamped parts, a little more blocky machining. I don't care. The trigger in double. While maybe not as nice as the East German, it's still very nice. And in single, it's great. We got a wide trigger with with uh, serrations. We got a very easy to grab hammer here. Very oversized. Unlike the P64, we have a slide release. A full length barrel. We've got an eight shot mag instead of six. It looks like a Makarov magazine, but it's not interchangeable. We have a heel release steel, but it's one of the better ones. Quite large, well shaped, sticks out. Comfortable, if not exotic grips. I was really happy when these came in, even before shooting one, I wanted one. And uh, I was really happy after I shot my first one because it was worth the wait. Just, just a, it's one of the last military Makarov chambered guns to be adopted and you can tell that they learned their lessons from the P64 and they really put Polish quality combined with the original design. It's not interchangeable in any way. 
In fact, it disassembles completely different. This comes down and the sliding comes off as opposed to the trigger guard. But, same general dimensions as the originals. But yeah, these were, in, again, not even adopted until the early 80s and not into service to the mid 80s. So they used them up until 2005 and even 2010 in some places. I bet there are still quite a few in um, police service and maybe reserves in Poland today. But it's a good gun for defense and one of my favorites just because it took so long to get them. And finally, the one that a lot of people are familiar with. The Czech VZ or VZ for our Canadian friends. 82. Now, Czechoslovakia didn't have a good time with it, with the VZ-52, which was chambered by, excuse me, uh, 7.62 by 25 Tokarev. So they learned lessons there, and when they finally adopted the VZ-82, they really made a great gun. They took their time, they did it right. I'm not going to say this is my favorite to shoot. It's a little snappy, just based on what it is. But it's not bad. I, I think it's still a very nice gun and it has a lot of unique features. And these were in service for a very long time in Czechoslovakia and even into the Czech Republic era. Because they have a lot of good features, as I said. Interestingly, this was the first service gun to have polygonal rifling. Funny story. These started to come in after the sunset of the Federal Assault Weapons Ban, which sunset in September of 2004. They didn't come in before because we have a 12-round double-stack mag. They never did a single-stack or a 10-round for these, and I guess they just didn't want to mess with trying to make a reliable, good 10-round blocked mag for the American market. But when the Assault Weapons Ban sunset, it was about the same time these were starting to be retired out of service, so they started to come over. Now, in early 05, I was in Russia, and I called over here and asked the gentleman I worked for with to order one of these for me, because I was still checking the internet, you know, even over there, and saw these were coming in. They were a little pricey. They were $300.00. And that would drop to 250 pretty quickly with a couple of mags. But compared to these others, you know, a little, little more, not exorbitantly high, but they weren't $100 either. So he said he would get me one. And I checked with him a couple of weeks later, and he said, well, it came in, and the bore shot out. There's no rifling. Sent it back. <sighs> It's weird because he's, he was very familiar with Glocks, but I guess he wasn't expecting polygonal rifling in a communist handgun. So I had to reorder another one. Because, yeah, at first glance, people that are used to seeing standard rifling in the rest of these 9x18 guns, I guess it does look a little shot out in here. Some other very neat features they did. We have an ambidextrous safety. This side and this side. 1911 style. Also, like the 1911, you cannot put it on with the hammer down. Which is a little odd because this is still a single action, double action gun. But there it is. We also have an ambidextrous mag release, Browning style, very modern. Doot. You can, this side's a little stiff because it hasn't been used as much, but you see. This adds a lot looser on this gun because it's just time and use. This is very similar to the mag release that Walther would use on its uh, P88, which is considered one of the finest service handguns ever made. So ambidextrous controls. We do not have an ambidextrous slide release. Here, see, not replicated. But for the early, early 80s in the com block to boot, being, call it 75, 80% ambidextrous, and having a 12-shot magazine, pretty high capacity for that era, and having polygonal rifling, boy, this was a really modern gun, wasn't it? 
It also disassembles a little easier than a standard Makarov. When your mag's out, you can pull the trigger guard down. You don't have to hold it down like on a Walther style. It actually stays down on its own. That's nice. Pretty large spur hammer, very 1911 style. We have actually very large sights, especially the rear here for a Makarov. A lot of these have pretty fine sights. These are pretty large with a large rib on the top. So these were extremely modern and very effective, extremely reliable, quite small for their capacity, good service size gun. The Czechs even introduced a hotter 9x18 loading, which is a little more potent, so they even beefed up the cartridge a bit to work in these. So they got a little more power out of them. But we really sealed the deal. These were dropped to $200 at times but these were actually declared C and R. Not all Makarovs were. So when these became C and R, that meant a lot of people with Kiro and Relic license, FFL 03s, would, would grab these for collecting, sure, but they became kind of a de facto poor man's carry gun. I mean, again, 12 rounds of Makarov, why not? Some of these others are not C and R. The P83 is not. The PA-63 is necessarily not, unless it's old enough. The SMC-918 is not, because it's a modern production, at least 80s production gun. East German Makarovs are, which is nice. Bulgarian Makarovs are not. Original Russians are, CNR. Mm. Original Russian military. Original Chinese military are as well, but not commercial. And finally, the commercial Russian guns are not considered CNR. This all has to do with date of production, sure, but also, more importantly, if the nation they were made in still exists. Czechoslovakia, East Germany, the Soviet Union no longer exist. Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria still do. Even though they changed governments, they didn't change nations, as it were. But I've always thought the 9 by 18 chambered guns were fun. I've shot them pretty much my entire gun-owning, sporting career. <laughs> and uh, the ammo has always been findable, even if you have to sometimes buy it in bulk. It's never been exceedingly expensive or rare. At times, quite a bit cheaper than 380, if not always cheaper than, you know, 9mm Luger, because that's about the cheapest handgun center fire you're going to get. I just wanted to share these, because it's... And they're fun to me, and a lot of friends have owned them over the years, and we've just had a lot of fun with Makarovs. They're just, they're just great little guns, and, you know, you could buy them, even still some today, for not break the bank money. And there's tons of history. I mean, almost all of these were the standard service guns throughout the Warsaw Pact, beginning in the, uh, in the late 50s and running through the end of the Warsaw Pact. And some, like the P-83, even saw use in uh, the second Iraq War in the hands of Polis units. So yeah, just thought we would uh, talk about these. Love to chat about Makarovs in the comments below. And if you haven't picked up one of these Bulgarian current imports, I think they come out of Estonia or Latvia. You really want to while they're still available. They're around 300. You get a holster, a manual. They're usually in excellent condition. You only get one mag, but spare Makarov mags are still 10, 20 bucks max, so it's not a problem to find spare mags. But I, I encourage you, because these are really fun guns and a lot of a lot of history. And in a lot of ways, they outshine the Walther PPK that inspired them. Well, appreciate you tuning in, as of, always, of course. If you like the video, please click like. If you haven't already subscribed, and can do so. We'd appreciate that too. And please tune in again next time for more hopefully interesting videos. We'll catch you then.